So this session is about sex, and our next speaker, Seth Stevens Davidovitz, he follows the big data wherever it leads. Seth, come out here and tell the people what their secret and real desires are. Thank you, thank you. Such an unlikely occasion. Uh, five years ago, I was a PhD student in economics, and I discovered that Google, the search company, had made available to researchers all their data, anonymous and aggregate, on what people searched. And I became obsessed with this data to the extent that I couldn't really focus on anything else for the next five years. I think Google searches are the most remarkable data set we've ever had on the human psyche, and I'm not really sure what would be second place. So over the past five years, I've researched racism and Islamophobia and child abuse and do-it-yourself abortions, all from mining Google searches. And I also researched sex, which is what I'm going to talk about today. And I say this is an unlikely occasion because five years ago, if you had told my friends in my economics PhD program that I would be flown out to Toronto to share my insights into sexuality, <laughs> they, I don't think anybody, any one of them in any possible universe could have imagined this would be the case. Uh, so big data is so powerful that it can turn me into a sex expert. Uh, for the past 80 years, if you want to know what people want, what people desire, what people are doing, uh, you have one main approach. You ask them. You ask a sample of them. You conduct a survey. And there's a major problem with this, which is that people often lie to surveys on topics where they're uncomfortable or embarrassed. Uh, if you ask people about their voting behaviors, you ask them immediately before an election or immediately after, an, are you planning to vote or immediately after an election, did you vote? Uh, the number of people who say they vote is a lot higher than we know actually turned out to vote. And this can complicate uh, research into embarrassing areas such as human sexuality. Uh, take a basic question, how much sex are people having? And you get different answers depending on whether you ask uh, men or women. So men, heterosexual men, say they have sex about two and a half times a week, and they use condoms about 20% of them, which you do the math, uh, this is in the United States, adds up to about 1.6 billion condoms used in heterosexual sex every year, according to men. Heterosexual women say they average one point, set heterosexual sex one point five times every week and use condoms 20% of the time, you do the math, women are saying they're using 1.1 billion condoms in heterosexual sex every year. Does everyone see those numbers? <laughs> By definition, have to be the same, so we know that somebody's uh, not telling the truth. Uh, so who's telling the truth, men or women? Uh, neither. I got... Uh, <laughs> I got data from Nielsen, requested data from Nielsen to test this, and there are only 600 million condoms sold every year, some of them used by gay men and some of them thrown out. So uh, basically everybody's lying about sex now. <laughs> uh, men are just happen to be lying more than, than women. <laughs> uh, internet data can help us understand sex, and this is kind of the focus of my research over the last five years. And the basic idea is that people tend to be very, very honest on Google. Uh, there are more searches for porn than there are for weather now. Uh, why are people honest on Google? They're online and likely alone. This makes people uh, more honest. In addition, people have an incentive to tell the truth. So if you're not having sex, you don't need to tell a random stranger on the phone that you're not having sex but you might have an incentive to tell Google this because you might be able to get some information. So the number one complaint in all Google searches about marriages by far is that a marriage is sexless. 
Uh, there are eight times more complaints. There are three times more complaints about a sexless marriage on Google than there are about an unhappy marriage, and eight times more complaints about a sexless marriage than a loveless marriage. Uh, the number one complaint about a partner, whether it's a husband, a wife, a boyfriend, or a girlfriend, is that the partner won't have sex with me. This easily beats the second complaint that the partner won't text me back. <laughs> and I think we see, in this data, we start to see that some conventional insights into sex are wrong. One, I think, uh, traditional piece of wisdom is that men are sex-crazed and women are prudish. But on Google, there are about twice as many complaints that a boyfriend won't have sex with me than that a girlfriend won't have sex with me. So there are probably a lot more young men avoiding sex than uh, society may maybe tells us. I think the Google data first tells us that there's a lot of... Uh, <laughs> Google data tell, tells us that there's a lot of... Uh, that there's, a, lot of, that there's a, lot, a lack of sex, I think another thing that Google data can help us understand is maybe one reason for this, which is a tremendous amount of sexual insecurity, which is very, very striking on Google. Uh, I don't think you needed me, a sex expert flown into Toronto, uh, to tell you that men can be insecure about the size of their genitals. I think that's reasonably talked about. But the degree to which men are insecure I was pretty, it's very, very striking in this data. So the number one body part that men Google uh, is their penis, and uh, they Google more questions about their penis than their lungs, liver, ears, nose, throat, and brain combined. Uh, men make more searches asking how to make their penis bigger than how to tune a guitar, make an omelet, <laughs> or change a tire. In this conference, we've talked a lot about the age, aging process, and there have been all these moving talks about people dealing with uh, problems with the mind or losing their balance, problems with the body. As you get older, a lot of things can go wrong. And you see that in Google, people are, are asking, men ask a lot of questions. You know, is my IQ getting lower? Is my cholesterol uh, rising? Uh, is my mobility getting worse? Uh, there's a lot of insecurity about this process. But all these questions about aging are blown away by the number one que concern men express on Google about aging, is my penis getting smaller? And a side note, uh, one of the top searches uh, that men make is how big is my penis, which I want you to think about for a little bit, that that's a Google search. <laughs> I think one of the things we learn from Google is that, from, from this search data, is I think a lot of people are turning to the internet to answer questions that really are meant to be answered uh, in other ways. <laughs> and I'm writing a book on all this research about sexuality and also all these other topics. It's coming out in February, uh, and I don't have a title for it. And my, I just came up like a couple weeks ago. I got really excited. I thought I'd just call it, How Big Is My Penis? <laughs> what Google searches teach us about human nature, but my editor says that that's an unsellable book, because <laughs> she said nobody's gonna would buy that in an airport. So I still do not have a title. <laughs> I still do not have a title for my book, and if anybody after this talk can think of a title, I would very much appreciate it. Uh, okay, I say it's needless sexual insecurity. Why is it needless? Well, we also can see in Google the searches that partners make. Uh, you know, people make complaints about their their husbands or their boyfriends or their, uh, uh, or their wives or girlfriends, and we can see what are these searches. So considering all this insecurity, our women, when they have every incentive to tell the truth on this source where people are so honest, do women make a lot of searches complaining about a, a, a partner's penis? And the answer is no. They are not as focused on this body part as men are. Uh, for every one search a woman makes about a partner's penis, uh, make, men make 170 about their own. And uh, women are as likely to complain that their partner's penis is too big as that it is too small. Uh, although there are basically no searches on Google from men asking how to make their penis smaller. <laughs> I think there's a lot of, uh, this is probably also not too surprising, the, second, the biggest uh, insecurity that men express 
is that they're, uh, is they're the size of their genitals. Uh, the second most common insecurity is uh, the length of their sexual encounters, namely premature ejaculation, how they can they make it longer. And once again, interestingly, it doesn't match up necessarily with the complaints of women who are very frequently asking how to make it go quicker. <laughs> uh, so uh, basically everybody seems to be on a different plane when it comes to sex. Okay, it's not just men who are obsessed with their bodies. Uh, women are obsessed, uh, are also insecure, and they make about as many searches complaining about, uh, concerned about their genitals as men do. Uh, and this one, I think, is something I definitely did not know about, uh, but is a huge concern on Google, is vaginal odors. Uh, and yeah, so I've listed all of them. I got this, this second sent bullet point, I got the entire sentence in the New York Times, which is my li biggest life accomplishment, I think. <laughs> uh, but this, actually, so we kind of laughed about it. When I saw this, I did find it very funny. But when you actually see the searches, li like what comes up, it's a lot of message boards appealing to like teenage girls and stuff. And they really think their lives are ruined over this, this issue. Uh, and a lot of sex ed, I think there is a lot of value in knowing these things that people don't talk about and is very rarely talked about. A lot of sexual education people contact me afterwards, how can we incorporate this into sex ed? Because if 16 or 17 year old girls are making searches thinking their life is ruined over this, uh, it's probably something that we want to talk about. And it's, that's something that we didn't know uh, before we had this data. I think it's also, another, another, and we also see again, needless sexual insecurity, that a lot of, the, uh, a lot of it doesn't match up. Uh, men do complain about a partner's vaginal odor, and what are they worried about? It smells like condoms or another man's semen. She's cheating on me, right? So uh, everybody's basically, I think if you wanted to sum up the Google searches, we're all a mess. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, okay, woman breast, yes, breast, this probably is more known. Seven million, in this in the United States, Google searches into breast implants every year, only about 300,000 go through with it. Uh, so a lot of insecurity there. Uh, what do you think men are, when men search about a, uh, that a girlfriend or wife is getting breast implants? Is she cheating on me? <laughs> Why does she need these implants? And the number one Google search that men make about a girlfriend's breasts is, I love my girlfriend's boobs, which also not clear what they're hoping to get from Google. <laughs> Uh, so I think kind of these two big facts that you see in this data are one, uh, the lack of sex, the complaints about a lack of sex from partners, and number two, uh, this tremendous insecurity with much of it misplaced. And I think these two facts that, that are so clear in the Google searches may be uh, somewhat related. Uh, maybe if we worried less about sex, we'd have more of it. I think there's a lot more that we can learn and I'm gonna have to rush through a little bit this study, but I think one of the things in this new data is we get uh, big clues into questions, into big questions that have been hard to answer using traditional data. So this is kind of a famous question, how many men are gay, how many men are predominantly attracted to men? Uh, if you ask them according to surveys, you get that about 3% of men are gay. Uh, but one of the things that's striking about the openly gay population is that there are far more men who say that they're gay in places where it's easy to be gay. So I'm doing the study in the United, in the United States. Uh, California would be a place that has a high tolerance towards uh, homosexuality. Toronto, maybe the equivalent in Canada. Mississippi would be a place where uh, there's a lot of intolerance and there are a lot fewer gay men in places such as Mississippi. A uh, huge difference is about four and a half percent of men say they're gay in California, only about one and a half percent in Mississippi. So why are there these huge differences? Uh, one reason may be that gay men born in places where it's hard to be gay are gonna move to places where it's easy to be gay. Uh, that would be kind of a natural explanation for at least some of this difference. And with this big new digital data, we can actually test this. Facebook asks people, what's your gender? What gender are you attracted to? Where do you live now? Where's your hometown? So we can see kind of explicitly how much mobility there is, and there clearly is mobility. Gay men do move out of places where it's hard to be gay into places where it's easy to be gay, 
but it can't fully explain the differences. It can explain less than half of the difference. So I think, uh, and, this, and now I'm going to get back to the source that I think is the, the really revolutionary one, which is the Google search data. So I think what this suggests is that probably the differences in the true gay population are not nearly as large as, as, as people say, and that something else is explaining it, namely that men in places where it's hard to be gay are not going to uh, tell people that they're gay. And uh, the porn data is very strong here, where you see a lot more gay porn searches in places uh, where, where it's hard to be gay. So there still are differences. There's more porn, gay porn searches in, place, in places where it's easy to be gay because some gay men have moved there but the differences are not nearly as large. So instead of a three percentage point po difference in the gay population, we're talking about a one percentage point difference. And a lot more gay porn in Mississippi than the percent of men who say they're gay. What this says is that there are a lot of gay men in the closet in places where it's hard to be gay, and there's actually even more of this evidence for this in some of this new data. Uh, of all Google searches beginning, is my husband, the number one search is, is my husband gay? It's 10% more common than, is my husband cheating? And eight times more common than, is my husband depressed? And is my husband alcoholic? And where are these searches located? Very, very clearly in the places where it's hard to be gay and where the other data is saying there are a lot of gay men in the closet. So kind of the searches of wives confirm all the other data and saying there are a lot of gay men in the closet here. Uh, also, data from Craigslist. We can now scrape ads on Craigslist for anonymous sex. Uh, men look for men, and we see that these searches are more common in places where there's, there's less tolerance towards homosexuality and where the other evidence is saying there are men in, in the closet. So all these different data sets con uh, converge on a very clear uh, story. Uh, I think from the data, it's about 5% of men are gay. Maybe that's lower than you thought. Maybe it's higher. I don't know. But the data kind of all converges in a, in a pretty similar range, and that the closet ma remains a big uh, issue in, uh, with, with a lot of men deeply in the closet in places where it's hard to be gay. Uh, so like Mississippi in the United States. And I have 12 seconds. That's Jill. She gave me advice on my talk, and she said I should leave with everyone should think of something. Everyone should, I should leave people with one thought to take away from it. And I can't think of any one thought, so. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but uh, thank you. So Seth, I, I think I speak for the public here. The people want to know, does being a sex quant help your social life? <laughs> uh, not as much as I would have guessed before I started. I may have not <laughs> chosen this path if I had known how little it would help. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for that. <laughs>